from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again, without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman Podcast. Each week I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. I'll be asking my guest each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Thank you, Sarah Blair, for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Do you want to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? then head to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you will get to headline the show just like Sarah did today. This week's Extraordinary Woman is Karen Mangiacotti. Karen is the co-host of the Keto Families and Keto Kids podcast with her husband Mark Miller. Karen and Mark met through Carl Franklin on a podcast they all did together a decade or so ago. Mark, Karen and Carl all began keto together after a scary cancer diagnosis for Mark, who is now cancer-free. And the rest is keto history. Karen is a writer, speaker, troublemaker, whose blogging and vlogging can be found at dangersnacks.com. I was expecting a whirlwind when I recorded with Karen, and I got one. She's one of those people who has a head full of creative ideas and delights in sharing them with you. I enjoyed trying to keep up with her. Welcome to the Keto Woman podcast. I've been waiting a while to interview this lady, Karen Mangiacotti. Hello. Hello. Hi, Daisy. This is Karen Mangiacotti. I've been waiting a while to come on this show. I'm so, so excited by this show and I'm so excited by your sort of target audience format. I think it's really good, right? Because keto for women can sometimes be super different than keto for men. Absolutely. So I love that you're here and giving it a voice and a, and a, you know, a place for people to go to ask questions for our particular, you know, emotional and physical and spiritual keto journey that is going to look different, right? It's a, it's a bit of a gender difference. I can, I can tell you, cause, um, as you know, I, I do keto with my husband, Mark Miller, who, uh, is male and, <laughs> and, Simply because of that, I think in some ways it's a really different journey. So thank you for being here, Daisy, and thank you for this podcast. Well, thank you. We're, we're complicated beings, right? So it's it's nice to explore all those different levels. So complicated, and in <laughs> fact, and in fact, on my keto journey, like I've often gone to the to Richard and Carl and the the two keto dudes and been like, "What is happening?" And sometimes the most they can come back at me with is, "Women are complicated, and we don't know." <laughs> so yeah, and that has certainly been the case, you know, um, for me as as. As you know, and as some people, um, kick ass keto bitches know, and, and certainly, uh, people who have followed my journey at all, it, it's been a complicated journey, right? And it hasn't been, um, 
it hasn't been all great, my keto journey. I I started with my husband, Mark Miller, got cancer a few years ago. And we, at that time, I was big into like yoga life and and sort of juicing all of the time and doing that and steadily gaining weight. You know, I was, I was, I was like, what is happening? Why are all my friends so skinny? And why am I so not? And why do I continue to gain weight? And now in retrospect, we know it was because I was juicing all the time and putting a lot of sugar in my body. But anyway, Mark got cancer, my husband got cancer. And we I said, that's okay, we're just going to raw foods this and we're going to get rid of the cancer. And and Mark said, yeah, I'd rather die. <laughs> Because that's, After that's, a few that's one of the big things you you often see as as a cancer cure, don't you? It's these you know pictures of ju yeah. juicing all the things. Sure, and it works for some people. Crazy sexy cancer was what I was reading by Chris Carr, and for her it really worked. For whatever reason, her metabolism can sustain the amount of juicing that she does mm -hmm. in all all different ways, and she does lots of other good things, and and it works for her. But it wasn't working for me, and it was. Definitely not going to work for my husband. So research, research, research. Richard Morris. Um, he's like, okay, I'm not going to do that, but I will do keto. And, and I said like, yeah, okay, I'll do it with you because when your husband has cancer and you want to support, you know, you're up against a wall. It's devastating and you'll do anything. So I was like, fine, I'll do this other thing. But as, as, as a, as an overweight woman and as, you know, somebody who had struggles with has struggled with weight my whole life. I was like, fine, I'll do this other stupid diet. What's the difference between this and raw foods and, you know, cabbage soup and whatever injections in my back, whatever, uh, thing you've got, fine, I'll try it. Uh, yeah, at least, what, at least oh, you can eat bacon. So, right. <laughs> what, right. What's the harm? Well, actually, <laughs> I didn't used to love bacon because here's the little, and, and I still, this is, this is a really funny part because some people are like, you can't be keto and not like bacon. And I do, and I will eat it. And it's certainly a food that helps me stay on track. But like Mark Miller eats so much bacon that <laughs> a couple of years bacon. into our relation, <laughs> yes, a couple of years into our relationship, I was like, this is disgusting. And I never want to see bacon again. And I had lots of restrictions on when it can be made in our house, you know, because for me, Bacon is lovely to eat, but I don't want my bedroom to smell like bacon. Like, I don't want my living room to smell like bacon all the time. So, so he's on a strict schedule. Don't, and if I'm leaving don't him eat bacon. bacon. Don't let him eat bacon in the bedroom. It's easy. No, I know, I know what you mean. That's where you need, you need a very powerful extractor fan. That's the key. <laughs> you, that's the, may be the key, but I don't let him eat bacon in the bedroom. And it's a point of contention. My marriage has almost ended over me not letting him eat bacon in the bedroom. He literally, he'll go outside the door and like eat his bacon. And it's hysterical. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, my wife will let me eat my bacon in the bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, hell no. But anyway, so, so we decided to try the keto thing. You know, Mark, Mark was going on it and I went on it too. And, and what happened for him, he, and so he started a little bit before me and I started. Um, and it actually, I did not have the miracle keto first week of keto and I'm down. I didn't have that at all. And in fact, the switch in keto, um, made me gain weight. Uh, fairly steadily for a few months. Like it was not, and it was, I mean, I was, I was on the phone with everyone who, <laughs> I'm like, Richard Morris. He's like, I find this alarming. I'm like, me too. <laughs> but I, and I would have, have given it up except because it clearly wasn't working for me. Right. Is what I would have, would have reached as a conclusion. However, my brain was functioning like never before, right? So I was, as you may or may not have ascertained from this far in the interview, I am ADD, like AF. I'm very ADD. So I, it's very difficult for me to stay on task for a long time. But the switch to keto and the fuel for my brain that changed changed that. So our experience, and maybe you've heard us talk about that, but Mark had gone away for about a week. And so we were keto separately. And we came back together after the week. And we were both like, whoa, like, I'm like, look, I made a list. And I checked off all the items on it. Like <laughs> I did this, and this and this and these things that I haven't done in a really long time, right? Just because I'm like, Oh, whatever, you know, in my my scattered brain never let me get to to complete it. Right? I was writing one day, 
And I'm the kind of writer who writes with at least five tabs up on my screen, and I work on five projects as, at once because my brain works on five projects at once. And I was like, I looked up and I had been writing the same thing for two and a half hours. And that, to me, had never happened before. So I was like, okay. So I thought for my brain, I'm like, I'm going to stick with this, and I'm going to like, you know, keep calm and do this because I know... I know that it's working on some level. My brain is telling me it's working on some level. So for months, I I gained weight. I mean, literally, like yoga all the time, pretty strict, strict keto, and and gaining weight. And this was the time when I would say, like, what is happening? And sometimes I just got the answer: women are complicated, and just let's let's write it out. Let's write it out. So I did, and in in uh, towards like the end, and then I got to a plateau. Right. So I wasn't losing weight, but I wasn't gaining weight um, for a couple of weeks. And then the weight started to come off and it started and it wasn't linear. My journey has not been, you know, linear through keto. It's been this way and that way. As I know, I share this path with many, many people. It's not like you have a starting point and an ending point and everything works to plan. <laughs> it rarely do things work to plan, as we know. And certainly with keto, that wasn't the case. But, but then I was having this, this experience where I was just doing the same things that I was doing before. But, uh, but, you know, my body had adjusted or shifted or changed. And so the weight started to come off. And as I said, you know, not linear. And so it would be sometimes five pounds back and two pounds forward. And, you know, I did this kind of thing. And, but I just, I, I, two things happened. As I said, my brain started to work better. And the other thing that happened was I felt in complete control and I felt intuitively in control. So for me, like pretty much everything, all kinds of living is done by intuition. So a plan like Weight Watchers, right, which is very external forces and very this much of this and this much of this and count that, it was never going to work for me. I mean, it can for a finite period of time, but unless it's unless I can really have an intrinsic sense of what I'm putting into my body being right for me or not, that's it's not the way of eating for me. Um, and so I, it took me a I took me whatever, 45 years to figure that out, <laughs> that, um, that external dietary guidelines were never going to work for me. Right. But, but this sense that I have with keto, which is I, I now look at food and I'm like, Oh, that's a really pretty cupcake. And it's also completely not food. Right. <laughs> it's also the same as this plastic cupcake in my kids play set. Right. In a lot of ways, in terms of what it's going to give. I can eat the plastic one or I can eat the one from this beautiful bakery and get the same amount of nutritional benefit. Uh, in fact, obviously worse with the sugar. But so for me, I've really incorporated that into my foundation. And so and again, I've also never been I, I'm not a counter. I can't do the things where I kind of count my macros. I don't science keto like a lot of people do. I don't do it because um, for me, it needs to be the long haul. It really does. And if and I know just because of who I am, I need to do it intuitively and I need to do it um, and I need to do it uh, without kind of putting the, the, the counting restrictions on me because if I, if I think that I'm going to do that, it's only going to be for a short period of time. And that I have done, in fairness. I do sometimes, if I'm struggling, I'll do a finite period of time where I count and I, I do ketosis urine strips and I, I keep careful track of things if I feel like I need that on track thing. But for me, it's only a reset to get back to the place where I'm eating intuitively. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting you talking about that. We it, it comes up quite often. You're probably familiar with the the work of Gretchen Rubin and yes. her different tendencies. And it, it's interesting when you've when you've been looking into it and you start thinking what what kind of tendency does this person have that I'm talking to? And I I definitely put you in the in the well questioner or there's a there's a bit of rebel going on there as well but it's that when you were talking about the accountability and that's why Weight Watchers will work great for a particular group of people for upholders and sometimes and for potentially for obligers as well because they like that external accountability well if you're someone who naturally questions 
that kind of accountability and all the facts that they're giving you. Or if you're a rebel like me, whose automatic response when someone tells you what to do is to not want to do it and potentially to do the opposite. <laughs> you know, yes, that, that kind absolutely. of, that kind of system isn't going to work, but it sounds right. very much like you, you constantly question everything. But what you were saying about once you find your reason for doing something, once you find your why and you have a strong motivation, that's it. That rule is kind of, you know, is, is set in yeah. stone because it, it works for you. So you're going to do it. And so you're absolutely, you know, you're going to, you're going to stick with that. Right. For me, it just, that's definitely, you're right. And it, and it, it is completely dependent on who you are. Right. That's why it's so variable, isn't it? That's why it's completely different for everyone. And why it always just makes me laugh and want to hit my head against the wall when someone tries to tell you there's there's one way of doing it and that's going to work for everybody right it's like religion <laughs> or it's like it's like anything it's like beauty it's like any way that you do it if you can learn to work with who you are work with your rebelliousness and work with your questioning or your or or whatever you're bringing to the table right you're living at peace with yourself, you know? And for me, it's it's so interesting. So I have this, keto was a, a, a big revelation for me in terms of like, oh, I was like, wait, what? I, I can actually be in control of my weight because I had done, as I said, I had done so many things. I had done Weight Watchers and I had done, you know, vegetarianism and veganism and things that did not work for my body and always considered it a failure on my part. I'm failing. Because we right? do, I'm don't failing. we? Yeah. Automatic right. response. I've, right? Because I'm like, wait, Weight Watchers works for everybody. Look at all of these success stories. Why isn't it working for me? And and I had this sense of being out of control. And, and, and once, once I have a sense of being out of control, I'm like, wait, I'm working this hard and still gaining weight. Forget it. I will just, fine, I'm going to be a fatty then, right? Like you just, you just kind of decide, okay, then I guess I can't be successful and I will just give it all up. So keto was the first time I was like, oh, these are delicious foods that I have no problem eating. Like, honestly, I could eat only olives and avocados all day, every day and be a happy person. So, um, so they were things that I liked and I felt like I could easily control it. It wasn't like when I had another plan where I was like feeling like, oh, I wish I could have this or I'm just not full and I'm going to go to bed because I'm going to sleep rather than, you know, than eat something because I didn't get full with these other foods. I mean, playing stupid games and, and never feeling in control of my mind or my body. Never have I felt that before keto, right? I always just thought, and never did I feel completely in control of, um, of my future, because so for me, I have a really difficult family history, right? Nobody in my family lives past 65. We die of heart disease. We die of diabetes. We die of all kinds of cancers. Um, my sister had her first heart attack at 42. She just had her second one um, 15 years later. My other sister was diagnosed with cancer a couple of months ago. My parents both died of heart disease and pancreatic cancer. So not only cancers, but a lot of digestive cancers, right? And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm just destined to be, to live fat and die young. Right? Like that's where I thought my lot in life was. And I didn't think because I had, I had so many failures in doing different kinds of things that I, I didn't think that I could really turn the tide on this way that on this, you know, trajectory, which was going to have me dying before 65. I didn't really think that. And now I think I have a shot at it. So, which I really need to do, right? Because I, I still have young children to raise. I, I can't leave this planet anytime soon. And so I, my plan is to just yoga and keto the hell out of my life and hope for the best and, and try to change these things because Maybe we are metabolically deranged, the Manjikati family, or maybe it's just been, you know, years of, of my ancestors and my family eating really, really poorly. And certainly that, that has been part of it. You know, I had to undo all of the habits from childhood. I had to give myself permission to also not eat breakfast or eat frequently throughout the day. You have to eat even when you're not hungry because, you know, all of the misinformation that we've been given. Fat is bad. Eating often is the way to go. Like things that, things that are just really 
now counterintuitive for me, but, but I had to change my intuition about that, right? I had to unlearn and learn, um, learn to really, really, for, for me, it works best to listen to my body. And now I've even reached the point, like last night at dinner, um, so for, for those of you who don't know, I have a, a ton of kids. We have seven all together and usually between like, you know, three and five or six li- have been living with us. And so family dinner is a big deal. It's not like I can do it or not. I do it because I'm feeding a camp of people, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and so that's often a time when I'm like, okay, well, I have to be eating dinner. And like last night, I'm like, actually, I'm not eating dinner. I don't feel it, right? I'm not hungry. So I'm not going to eat dinner. And I sat with my family and we talked and we chatted. And now it's kind of like more normal for me to not eat when I'm not hungry. And it's more normal for the, you know, nobody's batting an eye if I'm just not eating because I really do. I can cook the meals and I can keep schedules for my family and my life and the way that things are going. But for me, I need to really just think like, oh, I know there's delicious food on the table, but there'll be delicious food tomorrow. And do I need this right now? And the more I keep on track with that, the better I feel in general. And the more, the more in control and intuitive and, you know, it's, it's super interesting. You must have found how you, you talk about being in control and you talk about controlling your diet and your weight. And you mentioned mind there. You said, you know, controlling your body and your mind. And I wonder how much, because it certainly has for me, how much the mind aspect feeds back in and allows the body aspect to work that much better. So when your your mind's working more along the lines of how it should be, right. it makes everything else that bit easier. So it's it, you know it's it's not to be underestimated, is it that the effect that it's that it's had on your mood and as you mentioned before your ADD that's why you stuck with it in the first place but that must have really been such a benefit with well with every aspect of your life absolutely and i feel like even now i was i was mentioning before that i'm starting grad school right which is something that i've been wanting to do but i think i've had a mental block i'm like i can't i'm juggling all these people and i'm i'm raising all these people and everybody else needs me and i don't feel like i have it together i have that much control to be able to do all of these things and now i'm like of course i can of course I can do grad school, right? If I can do keto, if I can, if I can change the way that I'm eating, the way that I'm living, if I can do, if I can still live and grow and progress, then certainly I can take this on. And it does, in fact, your mental state is obviously you know, so connected with your physical state. And now in retrospect, I wonder if that period of time, those months after I started keto and was continuously still gaining weight, I also had a, a husband who had cancer right? I mean, that was a very stressful time for me. And right. And so, so that could definitely be at least part of the equation that led to this constant weight gain, right? Because maybe on some level, I need to keep this weight on to feel secure and to be nurtured by my fatness or what, whatever. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like we, you do what you got to do to get through the hard times in some way. And maybe your body does that too. And I think that you're, for for me, my body does respond to my mind. I feel like right, and and even so, even as far as exercising, right? Do you lose weight when you exercise? Yes, of course, exercising leads to losing weight. But if you are exercising consistently, you're also showing yourself, and your mind is in control of that, right? You're you're exhibiting healthy habits, you're prioritizing your body and your your health and your mind. And that spills out over into everything, the way that the hormones are flowing through your body and the stress levels are, you know, of hormones are in your body and what you're putting into it. So maybe part of what happened was as soon as we were through the cancer and we, I, I felt like I was going to, you know, um, that things were going to get back to a, a, a better place. That's when my body was like, oh, okay, we can let this go. We can let this weight go. You know, m- maybe that's what happened. Right now, we don't have any, ac- we don't have any real explanations that we, nobody can say why that happened. But I would say, and I do say to everybody who's having the same kind of things, um, as you know, like just stay with it, right? Cause if you can, con- cause what you can also do is if your mind is in control, then your eating is in control. But also sometimes if your eating is in control, then your mind is in control, right? You can fake it either way. Works both ways. <laughs> and, and, absolutely. 
Absolutely. And one will catch up with the other. And sometimes it is easier to do the the sort of the external things, right? (laughs) Sometimes it's easier to control what you're putting into your body, but you can't always control what's going on in your mind. But I would encourage you to try this mindful eating, this intuitive and controlled eating, and, and let your mind experience the calmness that comes with that. You know, and I think that that, that might be the thing. And, and, and we see, we see on, on, um, on your website, on your Facebook page, so many people struggling with stressful situations in their life, right? And they're saying like, and a lot of times we go to this, it's too stressful. I have to give up on keto right now. Right? And, and I'm like, no, <laughs> no, for the love of God, right? It's so stressful. Keep it together right? Just let this be your touchstone. And so that you know that you're giving your body what it needs. And you know that you can control something. Certainly, you cannot control being fired or a death in the family or divorce or, you know, these super stressful situations. We cannot always control those. But we can control what we do in our in to our bodies and, and some, to some extent, you know, with our mind. So that's really the piece of keto that is the biggest joy for me is that it's the keto happiness connection just in general, right? I'm not particularly, when I say I don't do numbers, I also don't do scale numbers. I don't weigh myself. I don't care. I'm not, you know, and, and people will say like, what's your goal weight? And I'm like, my goal weight is right now. This is my, my goal to be is my best self that I am at my weight right now, right? And if it happens that to change, then it happens to change. And I will respond to that when it happens. But I need to, you know, and maybe this stems from the fact that my family history is so poor and that I feel like I might not have that many years on this planet. I am not going to waste one day of them waiting for my goal weight to come around. <laughs> that is just, I can, I don't have that kind of time, my friends, you know? So for me, I don't pay attention to the scale and I don't pay attention to the numbers, but I eat intuitively and I strive for the best, the, the highest level of contentment and happiness that we are in every moment at every meal or non-meal. It's interesting what you were saying about mindfulness and being open to what your mind wants to tell you that that reminds me very much and also what you were saying about weight can potentially be a protective mechanism and something that came out in the the kind of counseling system that I was using was very much you just ask your internal parts to to talk to you and and reveal things to you and and they do and certainly one of the things that came to me was that how my weight and my literal fat coat if you like was this kind of wall of defense around me for for years and years and decades of my life because what i found very confusing when when i lost all that weight was actually how awful I felt for a period of time. But when I investigated that, I realized what I was feeling was very exposed and very vulnerable. I was, you know, I was getting the kind of attention that I wasn't used to having and was yes. was being objectified because of the way I looked, which I'd always kind of thought I was being objectified in the way I looked because I was fat and so I was being ignored. You know, this is all in my head. Well, not I say all in my head. It might not have all been in my head, but you you get the idea. But I yeah, realized no, sure. that this was this, this was this protective wall that I built around me. And once it all fell away, it was actually went through the period where it was really scary because I felt right. very exposed and vulnerable. So it, it's interesting. That's just what you were saying about how your mind works. It doesn't necessarily work with the kind of logic that your conscious mind would apply to the kind of reasoning for why we gain weight or lose weight. Sometimes there can be things going on that may surprise you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I love that you're saying that because what I think that we don't talk about is because, you know, this thin is supposed to be everybody's goal. And so you feel weird when you, when you get, when you have more thinness in your life, even in my case, it is not thinness, but less, less fat in your life. We don't always 
talk about the morning period. Like I still miss my fat in some ways, right? I was warmer. I mean, I'm in Costa Rica now, so I'm warm. It's fine. <laughs> but but it but living in New England without my fat, I was a little more cold, right? And a little less snuggly. Like like so this there's this great story. My little my six year old got into bed one day and um and, you know, he comes and he cuddles in, us in bed and Mark Miller says to him, hey, how come you always cuddle mommy and you don't cuddle me first? And my very thoughtful six-year-old at the time, like, thinks about it and, he, and he's kind of like touching me and he says, well, because mommy's skin is not as close to the bone. <laughs> And it's such a perfect answer, right? He's right. I, I was, I am still more cuddly. And that's a thing, right? And, and so for me, who identifies pretty strongly as a mother, um, there's this, like, being like a fat mom, you know, and it has a nurturing aspect to it. And when you lose some of that, you lose some of that, right? And, and, you, and, and there's a little bit of a period of mourning, right? And, and here's something also. I love that you're talking about, you know, getting sort of maybe romantic or sexual attention when you didn't have it before. So lots of people use fat as a mechanism to be like, get away from me, right? I'm not interested in that kind of attention. I don't want you. And I think that at times in my life, when, when, especially when my weight has been higher, when I've been at like my heaviest, where I've, my rebellious or my like, my, <laughs> my rebellious streak is like a little bit like, yeah, I'm going to make you find me attractive, <laughs> even though I'm fat. Right? Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna overcome this. I used to do this fun, weird stuff in my 20s where I would be like, I would like, um, <laughs> I would dress in a sexy way, but I would do something ridiculous. Like, I'd put like little nubbies all over my head, which looked weird and ridiculous <laughs> and like not attractive at all. And then go out and be like, I'm still gonna make people find me attractive, even with this. <laughs> So on some level, right? It's it's I I I did that as a um as a as a game like to play with myself at a heavier weight, right? I dare you to find me attractive or I'm going to make you or I'm going to rebel against the idea that just because I'm carrying extra weight you won't find me attractive, but at the end of the day I want to realize like I don't need to do that game. I don't need to have that extra layer, right? To be I I'm not less nurturing because I'm 30 pounds down or whatever, right? I'm not, it's not like I'm like, sorry, kids, you're on your own now. <laughs> <laughs> and the thinner I get, the more I will ignore you. Like that doesn't, it doesn't change who you are, right? It doesn't change. You were a beautiful person with that external, that exoskeleton that you used to have. And you're a beautiful person now. And, and it just, it, it changes your, the way that you walk through the world a little bit, but it doesn't change the essence of who you are. Um, but, I think that we don't talk enough about about that piece that we mourn the old Daisy a little bit or the old Karen who used to, you know, and 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 there's there's another piece of this, um, which is kind of the stereotype of like the fat and happy person. Right. So you, you're like, like I I had to come to grips with the fact because I'm I'm loud and in your face and 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 sort of a fat body fits with that a little bit right you're like a little sassy you're a little you're the fat best friend right <laughs> who's like I got all the wisecracks and whatever and it and it can build your your identity to a certain extent and I had to kind of be like oh okay you act I, I actually still can be funny even if you're not fat like that's actually an okay thing to do right <laughs> but recognizing the fact that that our weight does become our identity and that when we change that, we might feel that backlash, you know, that, that backlash of not, not identifying as that person or that thing or, or that, um, or maybe not having people take you as seriously. Right. So now you have a lot more people like, you know, people who are speaking to you, looking at your chest instead of your face. And like, you know, you, so all of that is something to get used to <laughs> as you as you emerge in this new with this new identity. It's just interesting, isn't it? Because uh, I say everyone thinks it's just that perceived thing that as you lose weight, if you've been very overweight, everything's going to get better. And I think yep. most people are guilty of that themselves. I certainly was. It was like, well, all my problems are going to be solved when I lose all this excess weight. Right. Which 
Yeah, right. it's just crazy. <laughs> it's um, just crazy, right? Guess what? Thin people have problems. Like, right? Thin, thin people have lot. Thin people get divorced. <laughs> it doesn't. It just be getting to your goal weight. But I, I think you're absolutely right. That I think that most people are like, oh, and and you hear it all of the time. You know, I'm I'm going to get married, but as soon as I can look good in my wedding dress, or I'm going to take this trip as soon as I drop 15 pounds, or whatever. And and that if if that's one thing I evangelize with keto and with life is like, no, 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 right? Right now, today is the day that you need to do this. Right now, today is the day that you need to lead your best life, live your best life, no matter what your weight, no matter where you are in your, your keto journey, your life journey, your romantic journey. I don't care. But, but if you can really be right now, enjoying absolutely everything that's happening and, and magic is not going to happen 15 pounds lost exactly because that's how you you set it up for yourself you know my my troubles my problems are going to melt away with the fat and right y- you know I set myself up for disappointment because okay some of the problems did I'm not you know sure. I'm not, not you're less uh, winded on the stairs exactly. that's awesome <laughs> all those all those physical problems but that you know, I was very much not not prepared for those difficult things that happened with the weight loss. I certainly, you know, I thought it was only, it was only going to be good. So it's, I just think, like you say, it's just trying to make the most out of the moment you're in and, you know, trying to be happy with that, but just not putting too much stock all on weight. You know, I see it, see it all the time. Everything's, everything's going to be rosy once, once this weight is gone. And and we know it just doesn't necessarily happen like that, but it does not. But there are there are other big changes in your life, as you've you've mentioned already. You're in Costa Rica now. Well, that was a that was a big move for you and your family from America. Why did you Why did you decide to to do that? Well, to be perfectly honest, we didn't like the direction that uh, the states, the United States, was going in. We uh, about uh, November tenth, two thousand sixteen. We were like, yeah. We're out of here. <laughs> we, we, a lot of things politically, but also there was, we had felt, and I still feel a shift in attitudes in the United States. I felt like the United States was getting meaner. I felt like pe- mean people were being given a voice like never before. And I was just not having it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to raise nice kids. And I didn't think that that was the place to do it in. So we, Miller and I, um, we knew that it wasn't for us. We knew that we weren't going to be part of what is going on. And we, we didn't want to be in the meanness. And also, we take a lot of it on, right? We had started a grassroots organization. We do a lot of social justice work. It was going to be an exhausting four years. <laughs> and and I want to live every day in my best, most happiest place. And it was not the United States. So it was it was insane. I know by all people's standards. But shortly, as I say, like November 10th, we started thinking and making short lists. And I started doing some research on different places in the world to live. And um, something that kept coming up again and again was a happiness factor. And it was, you know, Costa Rica was on most of those lists. National Geographic just did a big thing about it. Costa Rica, Costa Rica, Finland as well. But I was tired of being cold. <laughs> yeah, let's go somewhere warm. Because <laughs> right? keto made me thinner. I don't have that extra layer. I needed a warmer climate. And so, and so anyway, so um, in 2017 for Valentine's Day, we came on vacation here. And on like the fourth day of us being in the country for the first time, we bought land here. So we really liked, I thought, okay, this... We actually found a great school for our kids too, where, where I did feel like holistic living was prioritized, where they did concentrate on the character of the kid and of the character of the school and of the, the relationship between, um, self and community and self and world. And all of those things are really important to me. And I thought would up the happiness factor of my whole family. So well done. I think it did. And, um, and just the Costa Rican people and the attitudes uh, really appealed to me, right? The, uh, this strong sense of community. Creating a community changes everything. And for Costa Rica, which is a, you know, a, a, a sort of small country with a stable democracy in Central America, but not a place. We don't have oil here, right? We don't, we, it's too mountainous for industrial farming. So it's not a particularly wealthy country. 
And one of my big discoveries about living in Costa Rica has been that wealth does not always create community, right? In fact, it can disintegrate a community. I was going to say, the opposite, yeah. Yes, and so I... I didn't even realize this v- before. So I, I grew up with not a lot of money, right? Now I grew up not, not poor, globally speaking, not poor. I'm happy to have, uh, for all of the things afforded to me. But, you know, my dad was a cop and there were four kids in one bathroom and it was definitely paycheck to paycheck and there weren't excess resources. So if our car broke down, we didn't just like, oh, just call AAA and send it to there, right? My car broke down and we called my, my cousin who was a mechanic or the house needs to be painted. We don't hire painters. Everybody comes over, we make them food and everybody paints the house and you create community uh, because you have to, because you have to, because you have to rely. You know, I love this um, as, as an aside in, in immigrant communities in the United States who often there are undocumented people who can't do things like get loans and have bank accounts. They create micro banks, right? So you'll have maybe 10, you know, immigrant families and they'll all put money each week into a pool. And so when, when everything hits the fan for one family, they've got it there. And then you build it up again and you build it up again. We have to do these things. And so that creates those 10 immigrant families are, are a community and they're a tightly knit, and vulnerable and trusting community. And that is super interesting. And what we're finding out now through all kinds of scientific research is that that leads to longevity and happiness quotas through the roof. You just went to Keto Fest, right? Didn't that feel like an amazing celebration of community? I think that's that's the top thing that people talk about when they talk about Keto Fest, that that's Mm -hmm. what's incredible about it. And that's what's different from the other conferences, which all the other conferences are fantastic. But Keto Fest in particular has this wonderful warm sense right of of it's a welcome home oh it really is yeah it really is right that was its inception it's a fest it's not a conference right it's a festival and it's a it's a sort of celebrating yourself and your your path that you're on with other people on the same path it's 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 a great thing it's a it's a beautiful thing that's been that's been done in new london connecticut which is not my hometown, but my kind of adopted place of, I have great affection for. I, I live for Mystic in, in that area. Um, I was going to say for 10 years. I lived in Mystic for 10 years, but in New London area for 17 years. So, you know, that area of the world is important to me. And I love that it's being transformed in this way. And I love that so many people in that area are are doing keto now. It's it's really exciting. But yeah, so community was part of the reason why we moved to Costa Rica. And it's it's been working out really well. It's not easy to keto here. I'm not going to lie. Like we, we cannot get heavy cream. You know, um, and that's a real, we can't, making oopsie bread, which was a staple in our lives before, is really difficult here because the eggs are so fresh that the yolk doesn't maintain itself, right? right. It's, it's, a, it's a softer yolk. Yep. And so, yeah, so we've had to switch that up a little bit. I mean, we do it. The good thing is, is that because we certainly are not surrounded by there's no fast food within an hour drive of my house or anything like that. And because there is so much, so much fresh produce and, um, and meats and stuff available, we, we cook at home and it's not the anomaly. Most people cook at home a lot of the time, right? So that is a step in the right direction towards treating your body well, in my opinion. But there are, I don't know of one restaurant in my area that offers a straight up keto option without altering it in some way. Not one thing on the menu is pure keto. And I, and, and it's been a real, it's a real source of, of education because I keep, so I'm friends with, it's a ex, the expat community, as you can imagine here in in this part of rural Costa Rica is tight and small. And so I know a lot of the people who own the restaurants around us, right? right? I'm friends with them. And I've said like, Hey, I would really like to be able to have uh, one, just one keto, one low carb thing, because I promise you that the tourists coming through here, some of them are going to be low carb or wanting low carb, even on vacation. And, you know, they'll be like, Oh, well, you can just switch and switch and switch and you can do this. And I'm like, yes, but just I'm asking for one. (laughs) I'm asking for one item on your menu where I can say, I want this. 
and I know that it's going to be safe and good for me. And you know what keto is, and you've prepared it with that in mind, right? So I just went and I ordered a salad um, because it was the only thing remotely keto on the menu of a place that we went. And the salad comes with a ton of shredded carrots. And and I know better, and I should have asked, right? But I'm like, oh, yeah, because people don't know about it. It's not like it was in the States, and certainly not in New London, where, you know, keto is, is appearing on menus now as being called keto. It shows how different cultures just have different things on offer, doesn't it? Absolutely. Eating keto in France is is quite easy. You know, I was I was in Paris showing Louise Paris for a few days before we went on to Keto Fest. And it's remarkably easy. You know, all pretty well every restaurant we went into, you could ask for a charcuterie plate. And right. yeah, okay, so they'd bring um, a basket of bread with it, but we just send yeah. that back. Nothing's no, nothing's mixed yeah. in, you know. You've just got this lovely array of uh, cold cut meats and salami and some pate and and uh, you know some some pickles, maybe some cornichon, things like that. Really easy, and you know, steak free is a is a typical thing on every menu. Yes. So, and and you can easily have that and just not eat without pom frites. Yeah. Not <laughs> eat, yeah, not eat the frites and have the little bit of green salad that will inevitably come with it. With and their yeah. and their dressing will more than likely just be a plain vinaigrette. So exactly right, and a piece of steak. You know, it, so it's 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 really easy for me to eat keto out in restaurants. So it's it's something you don't always think about. Yeah, you don't always think about it. Wait a minute, though. I am so sorry. I think we do have one place that offers, they've served this beautiful lomito, a steak, um, with arugula and some shavings of Parmesan. And it's, uh, and that's it. And it's lovely. Oh, yeah, it comes with French fries. So you just simply don't eat the, the, <laughs> the papas fritas, as we say here. Exactly. But that's an easy thing to just leave out. Yeah. You haven't got to be like picking bits out of the sauce or anything like that. Right. So but even that they do serve it with the thing. And so I think we I think the tide will change. And by the way, this plate of, of little bocas or um, or what's the French name that I don't want to destroy? How do you say a little plate of small things? The char- char- charcuterie. Charcuterie is a that's that's going to be meat. Yes, that's a that's a, a array of meats on a plate. Yeah, right. Or or bocas if you're in, <laughs> and that's my favorite way to eat anyway. Mm, right. Exactly. Mark just made me a plate the other day. I I wasn't hungry at dinner with the family, but then later I'm like, oh, just kidding. I actually I'm listening to my body. <laughs> right. So he brought me up this tray of little olives and mozzarella balls and salami, and I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is how I want to eat always. Yeah. So that's lovely. But here it's tough and I think that eating when you don't know like and we we just so we have a new podcast coming out uh keto families and we just did a show on travel um which is really hard and really hard to do with kids, right? Because traveling can be long days and unexpected things and lots of hassles and delays. And if you are feeding your kids carbs and sugar and they're melting down, it's not fun for anybody. No. So, you know, it's really not. So I, th- I do think hard and I, and I, we have these conversations with our kids. We're like, no, we're not starting out a day of travel with you eating cereal, even, you know, even sort of like cereal that is considered good for you with, you know, good almond milk or whatever. No, I want you to have sustained energy through the day because we, ha- you have to think of traveling, especially travel days, which might include planes, trains and automobiles as, you know, you're running a marathon. It's a, you're in it for the long day and we need to all be speaking to each other by the end of it. <laughs> and so, so we push water and we push, you know, f- high fat foods that keep them, um, in sustained energy. But when you are traveling and we found this out the first time that we came to Costa Rica, it's tricky. It's a tricky thing because we didn't, um, we were like, oh, okay, uh, rice and beans with everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. And that's just the staple. And we had to learn how to navigate that around. And, and sometimes, um, as we just mentioned on our Keto's family travel show, Mark Miller, when traveling, will put packets of butter, literally line his pockets with packets <laughs> of butter and just eat the butter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite that hardcore yet. I don't go there, but he needs to eat more frequently than I do. And he needs, you know, a more consistent, um, more consistent snacks and things like that. So he he does. He just takes out a pat of butter when we're traveling and we'll just eat it. So, but when you don't know what you're going to get, 
it can be tricky where you're traveling. I think you're right. Europe, we have not had a problem in. We can travel Europe yeah. pretty easily because meats and cheeses and butter is readily available. So you're very much at the mercy of, of where you're traveling as to what's available. So it's, it's very important to have that really good breakfast to fuel you, you know, in case you're not going to be able to eat for, for the rest of the day. Right. And I'm not going to grab you a bagel because it's there. Because for me, if I give my kids a bagel with cream cheese, which I used to do, my first, my, you know, when I was a first a mother or whatever in a carb burner like crazy, I'd be like, oh, okay, you're hungry. We need to get you something to fill you rather than thinking we need to get something to nourish you. And that's a big switch, right? So instead of going and getting like a, uh, I would go in Dunkin' Donuts in the States and, and get them a bagel and it had some cream cheese. So they had some kind of like protein and fat, but the bagels are enormous. It's like five servings of bagels in one. So I would be loading these kids with carbs and then being like, why can't you sit still? <laughs> I don't know, mom, because I'm burning off a ton of sugar mm. that you just fed me, right? And I don't, I never thought of that as feeding them a ton of sugar. I fed them a bagel with cream cheese. That's on everybody's healthy list, right? But it, it's really, it, it comes with, uh, that backlash of hyperactivity and maybe brain fog and brain fog when you're traveling with children mm. is not good. You get lost in, you know, lost items. You get, you know, lost children. <laughs> and you've got to deal with that crash later, haven't you? You've got, so first of all, yes. you've got to deal with the, the hyper energy phase and then you've got to deal with the grumpy crash. You, the grumpy crash or sleeping kids that you just can't wake up and that you're carrying through the streets of Paris or whatever. <laughs> Nobody wants that. So yeah, it's, it's been a real shift, but yeah. So traveling is, is interesting. Costa Rica with keto is interesting, but I feel like we're, we're, um, we might make a difference. It's really just Mark and I, but people have started to ask. And I, I'm, and I think that more and more people who are in Costa Rica, Maybe they'll be like listening to our podcast, right? Just because they know us. And, and it's hard to not be curious when you, when you start listening and you start hearing kind of, you're like, wait, I can eat cheese? <laughs> cheese, <laughs> right? bacon, wait, cream. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a bit about all the things you're doing because I, you know, I've been a follower of yours for a while and I love, I love Danger Snacks, the video series that you have on YouTube. I loved Mondays was my first introduction back in the oh, good old gosh, days yeah. of Mondays. <laughs> I remember Carl telling me, start with Karen's ass. I have to, I have to get the American, <laughs> the American ass. I like to say ass. He said, Start with that episode and go from there. Yeah, that was bad advice, Carl. That was the worst show. That was where Mark Miller pretty much spends an entire show talking about the size of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> but and actually, that's really funny. As as an aside, I so I um the size of my ass, which is which is still and probably always will be substantial. So Mark Miller is tall and thin, and I am short and curvy. But and he has like the tiniest ass you'll ever see, and I more than make up for that. But What's kind of funny is that in our house, we, um, I, I have, I have, you know, I, I have a 16 year old daughter who looks like me. She's, she's curvy and she's, well, she's, she's very fit. She's much thinner than I am, but she's, she's, um, but she's got my proportions, right? And she's got my thighs and my ass. And it's become this thing where she and I make fun of Mark Miller. We're like, oh, your poor little ass. You just have such a tiny, it's like not even there. I'd like to spank it, but I can't even find it. <laughs> so we flipped the narrative on what big ass and thighs means in our house. <laughs> and much stemmed from the Karen's ass show on Mondays, maybe. But we have taken having like, you know, curves and ass and thighs as like a positive in our house because I be, it very intentionally wanted to flip the narrative on that for my teenage daughter. You know, I mean, of course I do. Um, because also it, it has its benefits, right? I can sit on the floor and I'm fine. I have plenty of cushion. <laughs> I can ride a, I can ride a horse. I rode a horse the other day and it was, it was fine. I had more than enough. I saw that you have horses in your backyard cutting the grass. We have horses in our backyard. So you got to know this about me too. I am not a country girl. Like this is all super new for me. I am very, very city oriented. And so to have horses and like walk to school with cows. It's all very new for me. But part of moving to Costa Rica was that as well, right? I wanted to, I wanted to just change everything about the way that we're doing things. Because for me, 
that's how I grow and learn. And that's uh, what I wanted for my kids and what I wanted for us as a couple. And what I wanted for me personally is to just like, okay, city girl, what happens if you move to rural Costa Rica and have horses in your yard? And I'm terrified of horses um, because they're big. And I feel like I, I don't know. I just never had them, right? My mom was a city girl as well. And when she moved to just the suburbs outside of Boston, one day when she was outside with the, her little kids, us in the yard, she called the police to 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 say she was terrified. She had brought the kids inside. She had locked all the doors. And they were like, what's going on? And she's like, something's in my yard and you have to get here quick. And my dad was a cop and his friends come, you know, woo, to the house. It was a cow <laughs> on my mom's front lawn. She had never seen one. She was terrified. You know, obviously, this is like 50 years ago in, in the suburbs of Boston. She'd grown up in the city. What does that city girl know about a cow? But she knew it was big, and it was terrifying. I have a little bit of that in me. So anyway, I'm trying to, like, expand my horizons. So, <laughs> but... um. But yeah, it's, it's, so I've, I do, I'm, I am a producer of content. So I, I, yeah, you have, I love that you've, uh, that you, you went deep into the, to the archives of Danger Snacks. Oh, <laughs> you yes. Died, you I, I, I full on binge watch Danger Snacks, binge listen to Mondays. <laughs> but they're fabulous. I mean, it's, I particularly like Danger Snacks. They're, you know, nice little short videos and, you know, your, Big personality strides forth about, you know, really interesting topics, this great little short burst of, of content. And, uh, you know, they're, they're fabulous. I love them. And, uh, you know, what else do you Thank do? You. I, know, I know you've written for the Huffington Post. Tell me about all the other things you're doing. Yeah, so I do. I do like to do that. And actually, I'm going to be because, um, because I am, I'm actually happiest and, uh, when I'm creating, I think content, when I'm writing, when I'm filming, because, um, for a few reasons, right? One of which is because so much is like, whoa, whoa, we're not even, we're not even in the realm of thinking of this in a way that is, 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 the best way to think about this, right? And, and I feel like I want to give voice to that. And I feel like, um, I feel like one of my gifts in the world is that I have a, an ability to see things a little bit differently, always, always in my whole life, right? Um, and so, and so I, I, to some extent feel an obligation to, to even just say, Hey, here's this different way of looking at it, right? Like, I'm not saying I have an obligation to evangelize my way of, of, thinking and doing things, but I do feel like a lot of voices and a lot of diverse voices makes the world a better place. So, and, and even in small things that I've written, you know, sometimes I've, I've gotten lots of feedback from people who were really touched by it. And to me, that is super rewarding. You know, I don't care, um, I don't care who's picking up my pieces and, you know, nationally or internationally. I don't care who, what, what kind of money I'm making as much as I care about when I get a, an email from somebody who said like, whoa, you know, you, you said this and that had never occurred to me and it led to this, mm. right? Because as I said, like, that's my main thing, my, my main point of evangelizing in the world or my main, um, what I strive for in life is, is to just, to, to mindfully live your best life, right? To mindfully seek out the, 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 the happiness and the contentment and the being on the right side of, of history and morality and ethics and all of that. So I'm at my best when I'm creating content. Let's say that. And so, um, and I was creating consistently the videos and, you know, Mark had cancer. We had a lot of other really crazy things happening and, and, and they fell away. But, um, but I realized that even with all of this happening, it's something that I need to do. So I've written, I've written a few pieces that I'm going to be, um, getting ahead of the game and, and I'm going to launch every week. And also I'm going to be launching a Twitch channel. So I don't know if you know about Twitch, but, um, it is a live, it's mostly for gamers. It's a live streaming thing. Mark Miller has a show on it where he codes live. And so some of that is being done right now. And so even though it is a live plat, it's like a live YouTube. And even though it's a platform mostly for gamers, uh, I want to switch the game a little bit and create kind of a talk show uh, atmosphere on Twitch and answer questions, um, probably in the realm of, of, of sex and sexuality and relationships and intimacy, but maybe also, maybe it becomes a little bit more generic than that. Be so I've been a sex and sexuality teacher for a while as well. It's one of the many other things that I do. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I thought that's kind of a, a great way for me to do that because in the live format, it doesn't have as much of the, as you know, editing and uh, the things that we need to do as, 
as content creators and podcasts and and blogs and vlogs that uh, can be more time consuming. But also with that interactive aspect yes. that you mentioned, that really taps into the bit that's meaningful for you, for, for helping other people and, you know, resonating with people where you can do that in a in a live space you can be talking directly and interacting with them can't you right and i think it's important you know especially also with the video i think you get a question you know about something and maybe somebody's going through some stuff and you can you you're looking at them and you're saying like i'm sorry that's happening to you and you don't deserve that and that is um that is wrong and I'm, I feel for you, right? And I think that's really powerful to be able to do in a, in a world where much of our community is online, right? And much of our, you know, so online communities are important. And especially for people who, for one reason or another, cannot participate in other kinds of community, having this there for them, right? If somebody is so mired in whatever, Whatever kind of debilitating thing is going on for them physically or emotionally or whatever shame that they're feeling that's al- that's not allowing them to interact in, in um, physical communities, in real life communities, being there and giving them that real connection and to really sort of be able to look in their eyes. I know that sounds silly when I'm talking about an uh, online interaction, but it is not silly. Yeah. It is real and, and powerful. Right. I mean, you know, this as a, as a now a content creator and doing this podcast and changing people's lives. It, um, it's a, it's a powerful way that we, we are evolving as a society, as this community that is actually now more inclusive than ever before. An online community, right? I'm, I'm in Costa Rica, you're in England, and we're sitting here speaking in community. And that, you know, wouldn't have happened as easily 20 years ago. So, so we can say, oh, it's the downfall of society that everything's happening online. Or we can say, oh, it's the evolution of society that everything, that so many things are happening online. I mean, and no, it's no substitute for being at Keto Fest and getting to like hug your, you know, these people that you love, right? Or that you've grown to love possibly entirely online, right? Like I've never met Daisy. I've never, we've never, I've never given her a squeeze, right? She doesn't, she doesn't know how unclose to my bones my skin is. <laughs> <laughs> but but I still feel like you know I still feel like you're a friend I still feel like you know we have uh, we are connected and so that's really interesting so I'm 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 interested in um and in, in going forth and doing that more and as I said I'm also starting um in addition to this Twitch channel and all of these things I'm starting a master's degree program in instructional design so it's really a master's degree and I've always been a teacher uh, and an artist and so I love this concept of creatively coming up with different ways of learning for people um, really based on on how different people learn right really maybe based on individual learners or customized learning um which all ties into the podcast which all ties into the twitch channel and all of the things that i feel like it's the culmination of what i've kind of been working towards my maybe my whole life actually my my first degree was in um was in education and art and I feel like so those two things are important to me right (laughs) so creating and and informing and educating like all of those things so so that that's kind of where the blogs have come from where the vlogs have come from where everything where maybe even the parenting I don't know (laughs) (laughs) it's the beauty of the internet though isn't it that there is a way for everyone to learn a way for anyone to find information and content that's going to resonate with them in a way that they can learn and that it, yeah. there's there's almost nothing that you can't find now on the internet and nothing right. nothing that you can't learn if you want to right and and for example i'm i'm it's unlikely that i'm going to pick up a science book and study how my health numbers are uh, you know, what my health numbers mean. And I'm, it's un- unlikely that I'm going to pick up a science book, let's be honest. Um, but I will totally listen to a science show from you or from the two keto dudes. And, and that where I feel like I'm kind of in community and in conversation with them. And then all of a sudden, I've got that. And now I'm armed with that information that I would not have ascertained on my own. I just wouldn't have. And so, um, you know, which isn't a flaw in my character, 
right? Like that's the piece that, um, that is super interesting. You're not flawed because you're a visual learner over an auditory learner over a process learner, whatever. It's, it's who you are. And just like with, uh, Gretchen Rubin's, when, when we have a sense of, you know, who we are, what type we are according to that archetype system, um, we we can say like, oh, okay, I'm going to work within my re- rebelliousness. I'm going to work within that, you know, and okay, I'm an auditory learner. Great. Cause I can find a podcast on anything or I'm a visual learner and I can find a way to do that. Yeah. So yeah. I, and the other thing about the internet that I love is it's, it's a little bit like the great equalizer, right? Mm. I am now in community with not only geographically, but with people of much different socioeconomic backgrounds, which doesn't easily happen IRL, right? In real life, we don't always get that opportunity to be with people um, from completely different walks of life. And and if you have, um, you know, a computer, and it doesn't, it's no longer the fanciness that, you know, you can even have a smartphone, or I'm talking to you right now on like a $200 Chromebook, is, is what I'm, I'm set up on, right? Because I am, um, because my ADD and my general clumsiness makes me not want to have an expensive laptop <laughs> that I might leave somewhere. This really works for me. And, you know, so for $200 and an internet connection, the world is yours. It's insane. At no other time in history have we had such an access of information, such, such an, um, a, a, a plethora. It's amazing. You know, like uh, Khan Academy. I don't know if you know these videos, but like... Yes, they're brilliant. Yeah, they're brilliant. And my kids use them as sometimes as their primary education force. You know, my daughter has a math teacher that she uh, does that does not fit her learning style for whatever reason. And she was having trouble with math, but she can just go onto Khan Academy and those, for whatever reason, speak to her in a, in a way that's more clear and you can pause it. (laughs) Right. I was, I, when I was investigating on what kind of degree I wanted to get, what master's degree I wanted to get, I was shocked at the amount of basically free master's degree material that's out there. MIT, you can take a class from MIT for free from Harvard for free. You want to be an interior designer? You can go on and get any kind of material that you would acquire in a, in an interior design degree free online or for very nominal payments you know uh, no, it's 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 amazing how much information is there and it doesn't really take that much so i love that it kind of equalizes this and i think that if we're able to do this i would love to see programs in the united states for example um where we give each student, each young person, a $200 Chromebook. Because ultimately, with the amount of money that we put into every kid's individual education, that's not that much, right? And we, and we give them the access to Khan Academy and we give them these things and we teach them how to find out answers for themselves. And so then, if, you know, you can be a, a kid living in rural Kansas, And you can, and you want to be a musician in rural Kansas. Well, guess what? That's going to be a little bit tough, but you can do videos. You can be, put yourself out there on YouTube. And now you don't have to live a life of quiet desperation because of the resources that are, that are limited to you in rural Kansas. You can join Justin Bieber, right? Like you can, you can join the ranks of everybody all over the world. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully true talent bubbles to the top and all of that happens. But, but I think we create a world where we have less frustration. So when we were talking about the elections in the United States, one of the things in 2016 that was being talked about was this real dichotomy between, um, you know, the, the people who, uh, all kinds of words were used the liberal elite or whatever they were called and the and the real people right and i would say hey yeah of course those those people in in rural areas and the real people of america are frustrated but if we give them tools where the world is open to them a little bit more then I think that that eases the frustration and increases their opportunity, right? If you grow up in a town where the only thing that you have for work is to work in a steel mill and that doesn't suit who you are, but you have a $200 Chromebook and a, and a microphone, well, you might be opening up all kinds of inform- all kinds of opportunities, right? You could start your own podcast. You can start your own YouTube channel or Twitch channel or whatever. And, and, um, I just think it makes a, a world of difference. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, big fan of this and I, I consider it a step in evolution um yes, it is, it's very us. empowering and it, it, it is very empowering 
particularly I think for for kids in the education system it reminded me when when you were talking about the about Khan Academy and that that is something I came across when I was doing my science course I the course was an online course I watched videos of the the lecturer who was talking to students who were taking the course who were who were actually in the lecture room so I had videos I also had your typical textbooks I wrote my own notes I read articles I watched different videos of different people speaking I looked at things like Khan Academy there are some there are some great uh, videos I can't remember the name of the producer who talks about it was about different biological systems and things and as he was explaining the process it was being drawn on the screen and so you were interacting that way there are so many different ways and like you're saying it's it's finding out how you best learn and then just finding the content that suits you because there will be content out there and that's 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 very empowering because like you say it does it does level the playing field doesn't it accessible to everybody it does and it's 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 such a beautiful thing and sometimes you you sometimes concepts are harder for you to grasp for whatever reason you know sometimes people have a harder concept with this or with that and so you can just throw all the spaghetti at the wall right you can watch all the videos or the different kinds of videos and you can listen to the things and you can look at them uh or or highlight them or rewrite them or you can just do all of the things until one is going to help you open up that tiny little window of understanding, which leads to, you know, more and more of the light coming in. And so, yeah, that's, it's been really interesting, which is another reason why these keto podcasts, I feel like are so valuable, right? Because you're like, okay, you know, you don't have to commit to getting rid of all the carbs in your house and doing this whole thing. Just listen to this while you're in the car, just listen, right? And then it opens it up a little bit and your understanding opens it up a little bit. And, and you know, eventually it might lead to a, a, a whole lot of understanding. So I love this in terms of, of just, just encouraging more accessibility for, for everybody. And you're adding so, to that mix now with keto families. So that's your podcast. So Mark and I are doing that together. Yeah, I don't think there's another one like that, as far as I know, where sort of two parents are saying, here's what we do in our family. We have pre-recorded a bunch of shows, and we have one where we interview our littler kids about what happens in our house. From their perspective, what the changes were, it's super interesting. I can't wait for that one to come out. Oh, that sounds interesting, yeah. When you've got an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old, and they're saying like, yeah, mom, actually, you are much nicer now you're like oh <laughs> okay or, n- or not nicer but there's less of that you know up and down mood swingy thing in my life right at three o'clock when they're cranky and I'm cranky and we've been working all day and I'm like crashing I'm not like get your shoes on right like I'm less like that because I just don't I don't have that crash and so from their perspective to be able to have an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old kind of see that super interesting We interviewed our teen for another show, and I think it's going to be an interesting compliment because we, uh, we, because of, maybe because of my approach, right, which is very intuitive, which might be a little bit different from other people's approach, but still kind of works, it works for me, and I think there's probably other people out there who can't do the thing where they're going to measure and, and weigh and count, but they can do an approach that's more like, you know, where you look at food and you say, is this right for me? And then you eat it if it is, and you don't if it isn't. Like, I think that there, there's there got to be more Karen Manjikati's out there, right? <laughs> so on, on at least that level. And so maybe it will be kind of speaking to them. And we're not... We're not doctors or, um, you know, nutritionists necessarily, but, but we do have a lot of experience with, uh, family life (laughs) of all the different ages, including adults. You know, we have a, we have a 20, a girl, our daughter who is about to be 28. So, and she has been, she has had a journey with keto. So there's also that. And it's super, um, it's super interesting to watch all of that. So we do bring to it that perspective and I'm excited. And we have another, Um, like a tag episode at the very end, like a little short segment called Keto Kids that's really just for kids to listen to. So it's kind of the information that we said in the same close, in this, in the longer show, but much shorter for a smaller person's attention span. You know, again, throw all the spaghetti against the wall. And if, Mm -hmm. if kids will listen to this and even if they don't 
go full keto, if, even if your kids aren't going to pee on test strips, <laughs> for them to think like, oh, well, I already had, I had some gummy bears. Do I really need apple juice? Because those are both two hugely sugary things. And maybe I'll just do one. Even that change is, is if, even if we can do that for one kid, worth it for me, right? Even if we can just have kids thinking that, oh, you know, chocolate milk is really far more than your allotment of sugar for the day instead of just what you automatically have when you order a meal, right? Like, and especially um, in the States, you know, much, much less so that now that we're in Costa Rica, but especially in the States, sugar is thrown down the throats of kids like crazy. Every, every food designed for kids it's like sugar based. They're ketchups, they're yogurts, they're everything. So you're creating these kids for whom real food tastes gross, right? <laughs> if you're eating, if, if your apple sauce has a ton of sugar in it, eating a real apple is going to be like, ugh, you know, because you're just training your body. And that's what we've been doing in the United States, at least, and possibly more globally with the influence of the United States is just sugaring these kids up, sugar in their tomato sauce, sugar in their every drink that they have. The amounts of sugar that drinks are served in that, that kids drinks have is unbelievable. And then we're like, why can't you sit still? Have this ADD medication, right? You can't, why are these kids so out of control? And why do they then, then soothe and medicate with video games? What, what is wrong with this generation? And it's like, I don't know, maybe because you poisoned them for the first 18 years of their life. <laughs> maybe that. So even to just get parents and kids to be thinking, like, if I want better behavior, if I want better output, I need better input with these kids. I need to put the things in them that are going to give their growing body what they need. And also not, it's like feeding them crack and then wondering why they're spazzing out. Exactly. You know? um, and kids are, yeah, you think, know, kids are smart and kids are, uh, kids are sponges, right? They soak up information. So if you, if right. you give them the information and empower them with that, they can start, you know, making, making some of their own choices with food and starting to see the differences in, in their behavior and mood and, right. and all sorts of things. And they have, they have, they have started to feel a little bit different. I, we had a, I uh, actually, I'll tell you this one story, which I, I've talked to you about before, but, um, so I have a teenage daughter who, um, so she's, she's probably our most keto resistant kid. She, she's kind of our most, she might be our most resistant kid. <laughs> Whatever you rebellion runs strong in that one and um and and will not be told what to do on any level. And um and but she has discovered she she has even now said, "Oh my gosh, you know, like I would probably be much more over or uh, not much more, but I would probably be very overweight if we didn't have our house set up like we have our house. If I didn't know that I could eat a dinner, like a good dinner that is going to, that is a low carb dinner with high amounts of nutrition, then I would probably be bigger. You know, my also, my son said the same thing. I have a son who went and was working for Habitat for Human, Humanity out in LA and he's building houses and building muscle for the first time in his life because he's building these houses. And he was like, if I were still living with you guys and, and eating those meals, I would be jacked right now. <laughs> right. So they're recognizing this. But my, so my daughter, she would never call herself keto because she, def she will, she rebels against your labels, but she is, and a lot of, she certainly eats that way in, in her house. And for her, she's discovered kind of intermittent fasting. So she eats between the hours of like after school till bedtime is kind of her window of, of eating. And I'm here and she, she eats, she eats, right? I'm not at all worried about this girl. She is not, um, suffering from lack of nutrition. But anyway, that's the, her style of eating. Well, she went on a field trip here in Costa Rica and um, she she was in a different part of Costa Rica where it is very humid. She was dehydrated and she passed out for a couple of seconds. Not a big deal, but it was unbelievable, the response of the teachers, right? They were like, we're going to, you you didn't eat all day. It was 11 o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. and she hadn't eaten yet. She never eats before, even since she was a baby, never eats before 11 o'clock. It doesn't, you know, it's not in her way of eating. But because they're all rice and beans for breakfast, rice and, you know, they're all eaters frequently throughout the day. And that's kind of the culture of the people that she was with. 
it was ringing all sorts of bells for them. And they were like, eating disorder, you know, we have to make sure this girl is eating. And no matter how much she said, it's, I'm fine. I don't normally eat like this, or I, and I don't want the rice and beans in the cafeteria or whatever. They sat with her and kind of made her eat at every point. Wow. So there, yeah. So that was a really tough time for us and a really tough time for me then negotiating that with the school as kind of, you know, food abuse. <laughs> so I had to kind of like go through that with them. But it's a really interesting um, perspective that that is something that you have to deal with as a parent. Um, we had another situation where my, where uh, people misunderstood what my son was allowed to eat and not allowed to eat. And they called DSS on us and said, you, um, you're only feeding your kid cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Which was hysterical what because are you Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. But also, I'm like, I, I that doesn't sound like abuse to me. I would happily just eat cheese. But they they did. They came to our house right at dinner time and asked each kid separately what they had for dinner. Right, and when they said, I think, uh, I think it was like. Uh, uh, chi you know, chicken with a cream sauce and broccoli, and and they were and the the people from the social services were like, huh, you know, <laughs> I guess it's okay or whatever. But the 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 misunderstanding of other people navigating those waters of people who are super judgy about you know doing things differently is is really hard and a, a focus of our Keto Families podcast, because not only are your kids going to meet with situations where people don't understand that, you know, there are different ways to thrive, but it's really difficult as a parent to have people say, you suck as a parent because you're not letting your kid have ice cream right now. Because not, not realizing that my kid already had sugar at one point today. And really, like, I know you idealize ice cream and I know you want to eat ice cream right now. So you want me to give it to my kids so you feel better about your choices. But it, I promise it doesn't make me a bad parent to say no to ice cream, but you get a lot of criticism. You get a lot of it, right? And to me, sometimes that's the hardest part, the navigating, the navigating, empowering your kids and yourself to make the choices. And then as, you know, to, to sort of not to have to not walk the line where you feel like you are super high maintenance because you're eating differently. So anyway, those are all part of what we're going to talk, what we are talking about in the podcast Keto Families and what I think that we as, as people who have a keto way of living think about often, you know, and even if it's no matter what it is, if it's in a restaurant, Mark and I discovered that we would go out to restaurants and when we say, um, it's okay, don't bring the bread to our table. The waiters or the waitresses, the service people will be like, oh, okay, okay, I understand. I'm like, no, nobody died. We're just not eating bread. Like, they, they're like, they have huge empathy for you for declining the bread, right? And so, so that's a kind of interesting part of keto is that you navigate these waters of pity and shame and, you know, all of these kind of things as you deal with the external world. Or just world. refusal, refusal to believe you. That's what happens in Paris when you turn the bread basket away. They just keep bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, surely there's been some mistake. Exactly. You, you can't, you can't be eating in France and not eat bread. Um, uh, so yes, that's fantastic. And that's what I, I love about podcasts is the, the intimacy and being able to see into other people's lives. So I'll, I'll really, enjoy catching up with what's going on in the Mangiacotti Miller household with your Keto <laughs> Families podcast. It's, it's, it's safer to listen to the podcast than to come to a dinner at the Mangiacotti <laughs> Miller house. And a lot less, you can turn the volume down on your, <laughs> on your radio, on your podcast. You don't have to listen to it full volume. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic talking to the whirlwind that is Karen Mangiacotti. <laughs> Perhaps you could wrap us up with a top tip for the listeners. A top tip for the listeners. So if I were to come up with a top tip off the top of my, top tip of my head, um, it's just that there are so many ways to do things, right? There are so many ways to live and to keto and to, and to, um, navigate the waters of the outside world and that I think that all of them are beautiful and wonderful as long as you are doing them mindfully. And you're doing them, uh, you are doing them in the best way that you can possibly do in every moment of every day. I think that's it. Um, I would, I would encourage people to, um, 
to make that that your guideline for success, right? Your guideline for six, if your guideline for success is a number or if your guideline for success is, um, um, you know, if your guideline for success is sticking to what you thought your plan was going to be or if your guidelines for success is external validation, all of those are landmines of disappointment. But if your guideline for success is in every moment, in every second of every moment, in every moment of every day, I am listening to myself and my body and my mind and I am making the choices that feel right and good for me and I am, I am, I am not wallowing in the baggage of, of, of sort of shame or regret or I wish I had found keto 10 years ago or if I wish I, whatever. If you are, if you are sticking with that, if you are intuitively and mindfully living your life, I think that is the best measurement for success, the best measurement for happiness and the best measurement for doing keto. <laughs> mm, fabulous. Thank you very much for talking to me today, Karen. You are so welcome, Daisy. Thank you for having me and thank you for all that you're doing for, for keto and for women everywhere. To get the resources and links from the show, please go to ketowomanpodcast.com. Are you my next extraordinary woman? Maybe you've got an idea for a show, a topic you want to hear about. Let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. It's thanks to the two keto dudes that I'm hosting this podcast. So please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes and Facebook. Every star and review really does help. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support means the world to me. Thank you. This week's end quote is from Nadia Boltz Weber. Many of us are tormented by our ideal self versus our actual self. Between our ideal income and our actual income. Our ideal personality and our actual personality. Our ideal weight and our actual weight. But here's the thing. No one's ever become their ideal self. It's a moving target. It's this mirage of water in a desert. You spend all your energy trying to get to it, and that just creates more thirst. Bye-bye, keto lovelies. Bye.